Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Latisse Howard. It was March 2007. I remember pulling into my driveway and hitting the garage door opener. It was one of those moments where things happened very quickly and very slowly at the same time. As the garage rose slowly, I could see my husband's feet rush through the door into the garage coming toward me. At the same time, my eight-year-old son says from the back seat, Mommy, who is that? And in the split second that I glanced over towards my living room window, I see what's very obviously a woman's shadow go across the window. And as, I, as the second that I turn back, I, I see my husband at the car door, and he's leaning on, and he's talking, but I can't make out what he's saying. And, and for a second, you know, you know how we are. Oh, if I ever catch my man with anybody, everybody gonna get it. <laughs> and, and I had that moment where I was like, I can shoot them both, burn the house down with a minute, fuck all his friends, empty the bank accounts, <laughs> and leave. But before, it, it was just a second, because the next thing I knew, this calm washed over me. And I don't know if it was my training as a clinical therapist, because we are required to be calm in the middle of the worst circumstances, or if it was the presence of my three sons in the back seat, eight-year-old, six-year-old, and two-week-old. Whatever it was, it was enough to stop all of that. And I just paused. And he's talking, and I can see his lips moving. I can hear the sounds. But it's like that moment where you can hear your breathing and, and your heartbeat, and you get like sweaty, and you just freeze. And then I reached over, and I grabbed my cell phone. And I'm like, OK. I don't know what I'm doing. And then I'm like, I'm divorcing him. And I called my friend Andrea. And Andrea was like, you know, I, I'll get into that part, but I'm a first generation American on one side. But Andrea was like my Italian friend. And her mom was an attorney. And I'm like, yeah, I'm about to call Andrea. <laughs> so I call her. And I'm like, she's like, hello? And she's like, hey, boo. And I'm like, I need an attorney. And she's like, what? And I'm like, I need a divorce attorney right now. And she didn't ask any questions because she was a friend. And she just said, hold on. And maybe two minutes later, this guy comes on the line and he's like, you want to make an appointment? And I said, no, I want to come now. And he said, OK, where are you? And I told him, and he said, you're about an hour away, but I'll wait for you. And I said, thank you. And I hung up the phone, and I just paused. And then I look at my husband, and I'm like, he ain't got no shoes on. He ain't got no drawers on. All he has on are these damn basketball shorts. And this brother is talking at me, and I can't really tell what he's saying, but, but he got some bass to it. And I'm like, huh? So I, I crack the window, and I look at him for the first time. And I just said, I'm done. And I rolled the window back up. I put the car in reverse. And I remember backing out the driveway in a fog. And I made the drive to the attorney's office. And that calm just had a hold on me. And I get there. And I remember you know, getting, out the back, getting the boys out the back seat these two little boys and this baby in this carrier and walking into this attorney's office. And the secretary had this look. And it was sad. She just looked like she pitied me. And I, I just kind of looked at her, and I was like, whatever. And I go in, and I sit with the attorney, and he says, are these all his children? And I'm like, of course. You know, I'm sitting there in my hijab and my abaya. I'm like, of course. What do you mean, are they his children? And he said, OK. He's like, are you sure about this? And I said, absolutely. And we filled out all the paperwork. I signed the papers, wrote the check. 
And he said, you have about two days before he gets served. That's just to let you know what window you're working in. And I said, okay. And I remember like shaking, kind of like I'm shaking right now, but not so much. Um, <laughs> I remember shaking and walking back to the car and I got the kids strapped in and then I thought about it. And that's when the heaviness came and the calm started to break and give way to, to something very heavy because I'm like, I'm, I've always been the good kid, you know? Graduated top of my class, got married, went to college, had a baby, went to grad school, had another baby by 21. And now I'm like my first real failure. And it's not an exam, it's not a friendship, it's my marriage. And I hear all these things that I've heard over the years because in our community, in our culture, you know, we're Muslim, there's still all this stigma around divorce. And I could just hear everything that I've been brought up with. You know, when you have problems, you pray. To please Allah, you please your husband. Of all the things that Allah allows, divorce is the most hated. Divorce shakes the throne of Allah. And here I am in the car with a two-week-old, a six-year-old, and an eight-year-old going to my family to tell them, not only have I finally messed up, but it's the worst thing. Because I was still owning it, because that's how it's framed. And so I drove. And, and as I pull in their driveway, it seemed like a mile from the car to the door. And I get the kids out and we go in and I, I take a breath and I'm like, okay, I gotta figure out how to do this. You know, our family is always gathered. So I see cars, but I'm not really sure who's there. And I know that they don't know anything. And so I go in, the boys immediately run off with their cousins playing. I hand the baby off to somebody, one of my nieces, and I look at my mom and I say, I need to talk to you. And she says, okay. And we go off into a bedroom and I can't look at her. And so I'm looking down and I'm like, I just left an attorney's office. I filed for divorce. And then I just stopped breathing and I waited. And I was so unsure, I'm like, I don't know what she's gonna say. I don't know what's gonna happen next. And she just said, okay. And then I looked up and I'm like. But then I had to remember that what I had been living through for 12 years, everybody had been watching. And so she just said, okay. And then my, my sister comes in, and I'm, I'm the youngest, so I'm like the mild version of everything. Um, as much as I'm mild-tempered, my sister is the exact opposite. And so she comes in, and she's like, what's wrong? And my mother says, TC just filed for divorce. And she's immediately like, what? What that fucker do to you? Did he put his hands on you? <laughs> And it was crazy because I was like, <laughs> he wasn't putting his hands on me. That was the problem. I came home. <laughs> and, and there was a woman in the house. And she was like, good. And I'm like, yeah, good. And then it was like this shift, so it wasn't heavy. And I was like, I got two days, so I really need to start looking for apartments. And she was like, okay, let's bounce. She was like, the kids settled. We went, we filled out, I probably filled out 20 applications at apartments. <laughs> and I got, I got back to the house, and I knew that I needed to talk to my father. And my father was my hero. And I'm like, oh. I have to tell him that this person he trusted with me, with his baby, had betrayed me 
in the most basic way. And you know, families have ideas, but like I said, when you have problems, you pray on it. You don't broadcast it. You conceal your brother's flaws. You are a shield for your spouse. You conceal the bad, protect the good. So people had ideas, but nobody knew anything. And, and I never knew that it would be that. So I, I'm talking to him and he's like, well, you know, I know what happened and okay. And he's like, we'll take care of you. And I was like, okay. And, and it was the same awkwardness. I remember it being awkward the day I got married. Like the next morning he called me. <laughs> Are you okay? And I'm like, And I'm like, uh, yeah? And he's like, well, I told him, you know, that you're like a flower. And, and it was that same awkwardness, you know, again, 12 years later, I'm, I'm sitting there and he's like, because I told him if he ever mistreated you, that I would take you back. And I said, okay. And so that day came and went, no phone call. Then day two came. And I got two phone calls that day. The first was from an apartment that I had gotten it and I could move in that week. And then the second one was from my husband. And, you know, cell phone, I knew it was him, I answered. He opened the conversation by calling me every kind of bitch that he could conceive of. And it was like, it just was like a latch had been opened. And everything that had ever happened, every time he had talked down to me in front of my sons, every time he called me a fuck up, every time he had pushed past me, every time he didn't come home, every time he lied, all of it was just there coming out of my mouth. And I called him everything that I could think of, and then I made up stuff. <laughs> and I'm screaming into the phone, and my mother, who, who's always a lady, like always, like eyebrows and jewelry to the grocery store lady. She shoves me in a room, she's like, oh my God, the kids can hear you. And I'm like, ah, fuck you. Like, and I throw the phone down and all I feel is like relief. And I'm like, okay, there's this, this dichotomy, like I'm, I'm scared and I don't know what's next, and I don't know what it looks like because we don't see a lot of it. But I'm happy, and I'm relieved, and I'm with the people I can trust. Mm -hmm. And so I moved into that little basement floor apartment, and it was, it was literally a basement floor apartment. <laughs> when it rained, floor would be wet around the edges, and I had nothing. Like when I left, I left with my kids. So when we first moved into that apartment, you know, I got the boys an air mattress. I slept on a pallet. The baby slept in his carrier, but it was okay. And the next year, year and a half was like a lifetime movie. My divorce was horrible. And it was compounded by the fact that on top of him betraying me, I thought that I would be surrounded by the people who had grown me into the woman that I was. And, and I didn't understand because I had done everything right and everything had gone wrong. And I didn't understand that divorce scares people. And we were like that couple you know, he had the young wife who got the degrees and we built this house and we had these little boys and they were bright and everything. We were like that picture couple. So if our marriage could fall apart, people panicked. And the same people that I had fasted with and prayed with and grown with and, and grew my family with and shared and broke bread with, they were all keeping a distance. And I had never been really big on the fine print of religion, but I knew that I should be able to expect a certain amount of support and I didn't get it. And so I had a lot of lonely nights 
in that little dinky, moldy basement apartment, but I didn't have any more miserable nights. And I learned that I could be happy. Was it hard? It was hard as hell. I was still on maternity leave. <laughs> like, like I, it, it was crazy, you know, and, and I have beautiful, a beautiful family, and, and they furnished that little apartment, and I'm a social worker. You know, I'm a therapist, but you know, social workers, I make social work money. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was crazy for a while, but it was okay. And I learned that even when I went into the mosque and people were quiet and, you know, afterwards the sisters would kind of avoid me, I knew that they were dealing with the same shit I had been dealing with because we all talked. The only difference was that I left and that was okay. And my father said, you can be, you know, going through hard stuff and still be good. Like bad situations don't mean that life is bad. And so I showed them, I still kept going with my three beautiful little boys, sat there, prayed, hey girl, salam alaikum, <laughs> you know, and, and then I moved out of that little apartment, I bought a house. And then I was like, you know what, I wanna write. So I started doing poetry, published a couple books. Then I was like, if I can get through this, I know I'm, my story is not unique. Like we like to think we're all unique. People are people. I think that's what tonight has kind of shown us. People are people. I said, I can help other women get through this and show them by example, if nothing else, that betrayal the end of anything is the beginning of something else. And my father was the person who told me what I took away from it and what I live by. And he said, you can have all the faith in the world in God, but you have to have faith and trust in yourself. That's my story. Tease Howard. <laughs>